Hola, buenos días a todos. Gracias por estar aquí. Eh, retomamos el seminario. Eh, hoy vamos a empezar con, con Scandinavian Institute for Computational Vandalism y luego tendremos tres mesas redondas. A, a, de dos a cuatro haremos un, un corte para, para comer. Y bueno, seguiremos un poco las, las dinámicas de ayer. Como después de cada una de las intervenciones haremos paso a, a preguntas y a comentarios. Y bueno, uh, welcome guys. Thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate your effort and we are very excited about your presentation. Um, bueno, ellos eh, constituyen un colectivo eh, que experimenta e investiga en torno a las prácticas artísticas. Les interesa especialmente la relación entre, entre archivos, software y otros medios. Y tienen varios proyectos que, bueno, que nos explicarán hoy con diferentes ar archivos eh, de artistas eh, que de alguna manera hackean, modifican y, y activan. Eh, los nombres de ellos son Michael Murto, eh, Nicolás Malevé, Elef Prestar. Eh, tienen bueno, perfiles diversos, forman parte de, eh, parte de otros colectivos artísticos, como por ejemplo el, el colectivo Constant. Eh, Michael tiene un perfil como más, eh, eh, más de informático, más de diseño de experimentación con, con base de datos. Eh, eh, digamos que eh, Nicolás tiene un perfil intermedio entre curator y... y eh, y programación y hackerismo, y él ahora mismo está haciendo una, una tesis precisamente sobre, sobre el, el colectivo en la Universidad de Oslo. Además, tienen, también forman parte de diversos grupos académicos y dan clase en, en la universidad. Para más información tenéis como todos los datos detallados, los nombres de los archivos con los que trabajan, también los tenéis en, en la biografía escrita. So, thank you so much and all your time. Okay, thank you. So the idea of the lecture is to be a little bit performative and we'll be literally reading in different voices um, and I'll just say we didn't, it's not quite as rehearsed as some have been so it will have a, an a excellent kind of freshness I think, hopefully. Um, we, so we start with something mundane. <laughs> so. I go to uh, google.es, uh, I search for the word cultura, I click on images, <laughs> I click on uh, a button named Jaramientas, and notice menus with sizes, types of images, uh, timing, and a menu called color that has patches of color, which seem to filter the results. I now repeat this exercise. And I type google.com. I click use google.com. And I've selected English. And I type culture. Noticing as I type the suggestions, culture trip, culture club, <laughs> culture club, Barcelona. <laughs> Culture Trip Barcelona. <laughs> Again, I click Images. And I click Tools. And I select the color Swatch, black. So, and I read, how the entertainment industry's selective use of black culture hurts us all. Black, a celebration of a culture. Uh, Deborah Willis, Amazon Books. Models from the Gandasa Models Agency in 1968, part of the Black Power Exhibition at the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture. Is it your? <laughs> or do I say that? Yep. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> this was our first. <laughs> so in 
So the question that I'm left with is, have I searched for a black picture of culture or have I searched for a picture of black culture? Yeah, so indeed this is uh, a self-portrait of this three-headed monster of the Scandinavian Institute of uh, Computational Vandalism after a hard day's work of working with facial recognition software, gender-bending uh, facial recognition um, software. So, um, in a sense, this is a good portal figure, I think, for this talk, because as Michael mentioned, we will be speaking in... In, in different voices, sometimes giving voice to people who are not here, um, uh, sometimes to people who are dead, or even to um, algorithms. So there's a kind of ventriloquist dimension to this to this presentation. Sometimes we will pick up books from this table. Um, we brought a number of books related to projects that we've been working on that you're free to browse afterwards, but we'll also be reading um, from these books. So, yeah, this is the Scandinavian Institute for Computational Vandalism. Maybe uh, we can say a few words about <coughs> the terms um, through which this work, this presentation, but also the other works we are doing are distributed. And maybe um, we can use then the voice of Asger Jorn, but um, a very interesting translation of his voice, because I will read it, the terms of the Situationist Times and the, the, their, their take on copyright um, in Spanish. Queda permitida toda reproducción, deformación, modificación, derivación o transformación. I hope that makes it clear you're really engaged to uh, borrow this material and um, use it uh, for your own uh, purpose. Uh, the question we will be developing today is uh, what might the di digitization of particular photographic archives mean in a time when access to images is incredibly, increasingly, incredibly also, mediated by computation? Okay, so part one, bookworms. From the city of Oslo, it takes just over 30 minutes by train to reach the small village of Blakir, where Guttorm Guttormsgård has been based for more than 20 years. And Guttorm Guttormsgård is a Norwegian artist now in his late 70s. This artist is well known as an experimental and popular graphic artist. After moving to Blakir, however, Guttormsgård has devoted most of his time to something completely different from what he slightly derogatorily refers to as picture making. Since 2006, he has organized more than 70 exhibitions based on his so-called archive, which is not really an archive in a technical sense, it's, it's, it's a collection, but it's, the name of this collection is simply archive. Uh, and it consists of scores of thousands of objects collected over a lifetime. The archive project moves emphatically across most established social and cultural divisions. Here, individual outsiders and collective life forms, what is referred to as art of known and unknown origins, are documented. Masters such as Henri Matisse, Edvard Munch and Hokusai are archived alongside works of art produced by Soviet prisoners of war during the Second World War in, in, in Norway, steel wire artifacts made by Romani travelers in order to make a living, hand-drawn Qurans, Coptic Bibles, Indian bronze figures, <coughs> African masks, and Greenland newspapers. In this archive, everything seems to speak. No matter whether we're dealing with Sudanese headrests, Venetian thole pins, or Norwegian carpet beaters. For the past six years, the archive has been in the process of being catalogued and made available through an online database, which you see images of here. Alongside this digitization project, however, the printed book retains a special place in the archive of Guttormsgård. 
both because the archive contains an extremely rich collection of books and because Guttormskar himself has actively used the book form as, as a format to mediate and organize the archive. And of particular interest in this context is this book, Archive, which is a kind of tour de force in which the expressive possibilities of the archive, the everything speaks of the collection, is mobilized in the construction of a new pictorial language, new stories, offering a paper-based graphical interface to the archive. In Guttorm's own words, I was trying to understand what had previously been pure intuition. Now I'm quoting Guttorm. I discovered that I had a flair for seeing connections and gained a kind of self-confidence in my own gaze in the way that it has been searching all these years. The work on Archive meant shifting from a result-oriented to a more process-oriented way of looking at things. Nothing stood still. I just had to live in that chaos. Gradually, the images all became equal. The objects lost their original context. And so it became important to me to create new connections. And the spread that we're showing you here, this is what, one of the spread, spreads from this uh, book, Archive. Uh, so this is an instance of what Guttorm would refer to as an attempt to make picture haikus. And you can see that one of the methods uh, he used in order to create this, these new connections was to look for faces, even where there, literally speaking, uh, is no face at all. So. The letters of a book, for instance, turn into a face, and uh, this face enters into some kind of dialogue uh, reverse shot with the face found in this, in this uh, structure to the right. So, as you can see, Guttorm's books work with images in a variety of ways. Archive is, is a case in point. Uh, at the other, with the, it's more than 500 images uh, providing a kind of bound interface to the archive and creating an associative drift through its holdings. At the other extreme, we find a book called Werkstead, which translates as workshop. And this is pretty much the opposite. This is one book devoted to just one image, the oldest known image of a printing press. And throughout this book, layers of mylar transparencies animate the image in a mode that is both analytic and expressive. And the original woodcut, dating from 1499, only appears towards the very end of the book. Huh? The name of this book, Workshop. Work, oh, so it translates as Workshop. Uh, in Norwegian it's Verkstad. Yeah. <laughs> You will have a descriptor for each interest point and it will be in high dimensional space and um, we want to then cluster them to come up with the words and that will be our vocabulary. But the English language has vocabulary for thousands of years ago. But visual words we don't have vocabulary so we have to come up with our own vocabulary. So this is an example again that we have say three dimensional space and we have these different descriptors. So, I would like to go through the three things we have been showing uh, up till now. Um, first, uh, the search example. Second, um, the attempt to good, of, of Guttorm's guard to make images speak from themselves and speak to each other. And then um, Mubarak Shah proposal of um, a way to index uh, pictures computationally. Um, I think um, it's important in the first example to, uh, to remember how the relation between words and images and interpretation uh, is highly loaded um, as we see the difference it makes between understanding a black image of culture and an image of black culture.
um, as we have heard yesterday, um, what is read and what is seen belong to different registers, and they are not reducible to each other. Nevertheless, we, all, the ta all the time we, we see attempts at translation from the visual to the written word. And poetics and politics live within this irreducibility of words and images. Um, for instance, uh, Guttom's Guard is not just any game uh, with images, but it's also a way to contest the hierarchy between these two registers, and especially the hierarchy that puts words on top of images. And so he tries, with example like this one, um, to see how images can directly talk to each other and produce a face where in none of these images alone uh, there is a face. But it brings also very complicated questions, like is it enough to refrain from using words, like here, to dispense with the semantics? When two images are side by side, don't, we, don't they evoke a word nevertheless? Don't they suggest a description? Don't we see faces in these images because the word faces comes to mind? And on the other hand, is it enough to refrain to use images to dispense with the visual? Aren't words constantly sparking off images in our brains? If I say green grass, can I not have an image of green grass in my mind? So if words and images are unreconciliable, they are nevertheless permanently bleeding into each other. What happens then when this relation is enabled and complicated by computation? In the last video excerpt we just heard Mubarak Shah, an expert in computer vision, declaring there is no vocabulary to describe images. And taking a technique that indexes text, a technique called the bag of words, to apply that on images. And by doing so, simply ignoring centuries of reflection on the image. But our take is there is no reason for computer vision to be blind to the complexity of the visual. Or is it? So part of, part of the way that we work is to apply uh, computer algorithms, simple existing computer algorithms, uh, to images. Uh, so consider these images. And now I'm reading from one of the... An image is more than the, the, the sum of its pixels. Uh, it can be represented in many ways. For instance, uh, a core representation that a camera already makes, a decision in a sense that a camera already Im Im embodies <clears throat> is the representation of images as red, green, and blue uh, pixels, uh, complicating, for instance, when one wants to find the predominantly red areas of an image, one must consider that actually white pixels are equally red, green, and blue, and therefore you need to subtract, for instance, the red channel, the other channels, the blue and the green, from the red to see where there's a predominance of, of red. Most computer vision algorithms start by removing color uh, completely, uh, starting from a grayscale image, and often work with a representation called the gradient. The gradient is a mathematical operation that looks at movements from dark to light, or from light to dark would be the inversion. Sort of imagining taking a picture and having white uh, light areas become high, dark areas become low, and imagining a kind of flow of, of water and, and seeing that trace of water. Contours is a representation that tries to uh, 
well, we'll hear more actually after, uh, which tries to find uh, the longest possible uh, continuous edges uh, and is based in large part on the gradient in addition to other uh, techniques. In these images, the colors are random but represent the segmentation that the algorithm produces of the image. And finally, in this case, we're applying uh, an OCR algorithm, uh, typical in, a, in, let's say, the process of scanning a book, uh, which looks for optical character recognition. So attempt to find characters in uh, a photographic image. Uh, and often it makes errors. It detects sometimes actual text. Sometimes it finds elements which it finds textual, uh, but which may not actually be text. So each representation produces different ways of quantifying an image. For instance, the total number of contours or the, the total number of predominantly red pixels. Thus, each, each uh, filter, each layer, produces a possible ordering of the images. In each ordering, each image has a different neighbor. Um, in this interface, I'm Clicking, I'm able to view images in multiple representations. Uh, each time I select a representation, the other uh, rows reorganize to show the fact that in each one of these different representations, uh, the image has different neighbors. For instance, in this case, uh, a similar number of contours between these two different images. Um, but when looked at as uh, content of blue may have a very different neighbor. I start in the channel green uh, ordering and search for an image. Should I read that? <laughs> yeah, sorry. yeah. Okay, so uh, each layer reveals a different story, revealing certain aspects, obscuring others. The act of ordering is then not just about dealing with the raw values of digital objects, but about transforming them in dialogue with a certain understanding of human perception. So select an image at random, select a layer at random, move the adjacent image in layers ordering, move to the adjacent image in the ordering. What I would like to propose is that in working on text and images from the archive of Gutom, Gutom's Guard, it's Matthew Fuller speaking and I'm ventriloquing his difficult text, so you, you will have to bear with me. And we bear with the translators, this and is going to be difficult. This is a, it's, a, it's a difficult one, yeah. Um, the algorithms of the Institute for Comparative Vandalism offer us the possibility of imagining an affinity between different kinds of things that move through text in order to recognize and produce patterns. These things we can call bookworms. A bookworm is an avid reader, maybe an amasser of books. A creature with delicate nervous tissue built directly into its eye mouth. 
perhaps a voracious chomper shredding pages with its eye teeth. It may linger snugly in a certain volume or riddle a library with its digestive procedure. Chomp through a writer or two, barely grazing a word, but severing the gaps between them. Skim through the pages looking for a few mentions, a bit of gen. Others are books themselves, like Guttormsgaard Archive, that move through other books and archives, carefully amassing images and text to build a segmental body. Bookworms are, of course, hermaphrodites, able to turn every punctuation mark into a sex organ, generating further words, fresh worms, or carrying them with them in their clitellum. Okay, so the, the image that Michael uh, found in the orderings interface uh, of this wooden sculpture with the green tongue is not a randomly chosen image. And it will <coughs> provide us with the bridge to part two. The image uh, is called, it's called from the 1968 book called La Langue Verte et la Cuite, which was produced by the Danish artist Oscar Jorn and the French writer Noël Arnaud in 1968. So this brings us to part two, which is called Green Tongues. The book riffs on the influential 1964 book by the anthropologist Claude Lévi-Strauss called Le Cru et le Cuit, The Raw and the Cooked, which was his first in a series of mythologies comparing and contrasting recurring elements across different cultures via conceptual dualisms such as raw versus cooked, hence the title of the book. La langue verte et la cuite contains multiple wordplay. La langue verte, besides meaning literally a green tongue, also means popular language or slang. La cuite spins the fact that in French, to be cooked is slang for being drunk. Thus, Levi Strauss, the raw and the cooked, becomes slang and drunkenness. Now, Levi Strauss's work is decidedly academic. Its 400 and some pages uh, are primarily text, punctuated by a number of diagrams, often in the form of mathematical formulas, illustrating schematic relations between concepts, typically binaries, such as life, death, father, son, earth, sky. In contrast, La Langue Verte de la Cuite is driven by images, and in this Okay, in this sense, it's similar to the method employed by Guttorm Guttormskar, and indeed, it, there's no surprise uh, in finding this book in the archive of Guttormskar. So the vast majority of the book's pages contain black and white photographs, many printed full bleed, and each of which have been overpainted by Jorn with a single color to indicate their tongues, or in some cases, tongues. Some of the tongues would be evident even without the color, but many are rather more the suggestion of the overpainting, a playful gesture following the flourish of a decorative element or activating the negative space within an image. The color of the overpainting changes over the course of the book in accordance with a range of themes, themselves often involving puns and wordplay. The book draws on many sources, but most of all it draws on the photographic archive of the Scandinavian Institute of Comparative Vandalism. So, not computational, but comparative vandalism. A project that Jorn had started some years, or in, uh, some years before this book was published in 68. And in fact, in the bibliography to this book, he, re he refers to this archive as the Archive Anarchitectonique. So the notion of the Anarchive came up yesterday. So this is kind of Jorn's take on that. So again, Spanish-speaking Jorn. Tras poner en marcha mi Instituto Escandinavo de Vandalismo Comparado, Muchos se preguntan por qué le puse un nombre tan peculiar, sin llegar a tener del todo claro si tomárselo en serio o no. So upon resigning from the Situationist International, 
in 1961. So Jorn was one of the founders of the Situationist International, this avant-garde group. Jorn founded the Scandinavian Institute of Comparative Vandalism. And he is named as the director of this institute on the title page of La Langue Verte et la Cuite. The name of the institute, as Jorn just put it, calls for some explanation. Beyond a provocation against authorities in general, the name referred to the historic Vandals, which was a German tribe that famously sacked the city of Rome in the 5th century. So the name of the institute reflected Jorn's wish to challenge what is so as the continued dominance of classical Greek Latin culture over other forms of culture, such as those, for instance, found in, in Northern Europe that were typically deemed derivative of real or classical culture or even barbaric. At the heart of the SICV, so I'm using SICV as short for Scandinavian Institute of Comparative Vandalism, uh, was the idea of making around 30 coffee table books on 10,000 years of Nordic folk art. When this institute, the overall project, folded in 1965 due to lack of funding, the SICV left behind an archive containing more than 25,000 photographs taken by the French photographer Gérard Francisqui and his Danish assistant Ulrich Ross, who had been commissioned by Jorn to travel around Europe to document churches, graffiti, wood figures, stone sculptures, baptismal fonts, bronze medallions, stone carvings, tongues, etc. They came to the city, they came to Barcelona in 1962 and they visited many museums here, such as the Museo Federico Mares. So there are plenty of images from Barcelona and from other parts of Spain as well uh, in, the, in the archive, which is now held at Museum Jorn in uh, Jutland, Denmark. Jorn insisted on the separation of text and image, so that image could function independently of text and be arranged according to an order intrinsic to the image themselves. So Franceschi's photographs rewrite the conventions of objective photographic representation of archaeological objects, employing, as you can see, uh, dramatic lightning rather than flat, accentuating shadows and expressive details rather than repressing them or trying to remove them. So Jorn, Jorn's presentation of these portraits of stones, as Matthew Fuller has put it, is reflected in his efforts to print the books with multiple layers of ink to enhance the dynamic range of blackness or darkness of the images. Contours can be explained simply as a curve joining all the continuous points along the boundary, having the same color or intensity. The contours are a useful sh uh, tool for shape analysis and object detection and recognition. Paraphrasing a, a textbook on uh, computer vision, to find the contours of this image, a series of steps are required. First, the image is blurred with a filter of kernel size three. Second, an edge detector is applied to the image. In this case, the canny edge detector. The canny method, named after John F. Canny, works internally in four different steps. Application of a Gaussian blur, finding the intensity gradient of the image, removal of the pixels that aren't part of an edge and hysteriasis, a thresholding of the gradients. The contours are obtained as a vector of points recorded sequentially. They can be overpainted on the image. Each individual contour has its own color. Should we go straight to the video? Yeah. Okay. So this has sound again. Research field is called computer vision and machine learning. It's part of the general field of artificial intelligence. So ultimately, we want to teach the machines to see just like we do, naming objects, identifying people, inferring 3D geometry of things, 
understanding relations, emotions, actions, and intentions. You and I weave together entire stories of people, places, and things the moment we lay our gaze on them. The first step towards this goal is to teach a computer to see objects, the building block of the visual world. In its simplest terms, imagine this teaching process as showing the computer some training images of a particular object, let's say cats, and design a model that learn from these training images. Okay, so what we've been doing with the, the different layers is to examine with um, algorithms how the form of an image is constructed. We've, we've seen the colors, shapes, edges, and so on. With the, the video of Li Fei Fei, we're touching at another level of analysis. It's, an, it's a level of analysis that touch on the, the semantic content of the image. So it's basically how an algorithm now not only can describe how the image looks, but also what is inside. And then we are going back again into this question of how words and images are related to each other. Um, what's important in this relation is that we, we don't only find mathematics and images, but we find images and images. Uh, to understand that, I think it's worth, can you come back to the first one? It's, it's worth to, to look at one of the images we have been uh, showing before and to pipe it through um, a software uh, called TensorFlow, where an algorithm tries to detect the content and describe the image for us. So what you see on this picture is actually a list of labels, and next to each of these labels, the score, so the sort of evaluation the algorithm makes, and it's, it's sort of confidence to affirm that um, this image contains a green mamba, um, a vine snake, a shoji, and, and so on and so forth. Now if we go um, a bit more in depth and look at um, what images the scripts use to learn what are these labels, we can see that it doesn't come to the conclusion that there is a snake, that there is a shower curtain in this image, just by the magic of mathematics. But because larges, large databases have been assembled that give the algorithm a worldview, and the algorithm learns from these 40 millions of images that are classified in um, a, a very large taxonomy, um, to infer the presence of these labels into images. So, in a way, the algorithm uh, while it performs the task of describing an image, is also connecting to a vast assemblage of classified images that happen behind the scene. So now, <laughs> part three. Part three, computational vandalism between the archive and the street. And back to Spanish-speaking yarn. El detournement es un juego que nace de la capacidad de desvalorización. Solo quien es capaz de desvalorizar podrá crear valores nuevos. Y solo donde hay algo que desvalorizar, es decir, donde exista ya un valor establecido, podrá alguien acometer la desvalorización. A nosotros corresponde desvalorizar o ser desvalorizados según nuestra capacidad para reinvertir en nuestra propia cultura. So Jorn's offering of overpaintings as visual evidence uh, in a new kind of academic discourse makes the radical proposal to embrace the subjectivity of the image, asserting the image as something that is open to multiple interpretations. 
an algorithmic treatment such as the contour tracing can usefully be seen as a, as a kind of overpainting, a performative act contingent on the situated application of the algorithm to the image. So far from producing a kind of essential reduction or classification that consumes its subject, the algorithmic overpainting suggests new ways to read and reread the image. So maybe and last uh, image is uh, so we made an installation in uh, Constant uh, in in uh, the office in the window of the office of Constant which consisted in a kind of surveillance apparatus, a sur sort of surveillance setup, but turned to show how it was working uh, towards its, uh, its both sort of victims being, <laughs> the people being recorded, uh, the subjects, uh, and, uh, but it would reveal what it would show. And so basically as you walked past it, when it would, a camera, if it would detect faces, would start to record 15 frames and would then take faces often not actual faces, but uh, it would take objects that had been detected as faces from the archive and, and flip them onto the uh, passers-by and produce a kind of uh, animated uh, loop, which then they would see. And it ran for 40 days. Um, it was very interesting to see how it often would be tricked by the changing lighting conditions. So for instance, it would often see faces in twilight uh, and certain kinds of things, well, that was like the arches across the street, when the sunlight would change, uh, uh, it could start to see faces in the archways or in hubcaps was often uh, seen. But quite a magical moment and for us where we sort of, why we called this uh, talk, uh, giving the finger back to the digital, it's a bit of, of a pun. As Jorn works with puns, we look as well for ways to work in punning. Um, one Friday night uh, on day 24, a pair uh, noticed and worked with the sort of performed the system. And what is interesting is because it worked kind of slowly, it, it actually, in order to really uh, engage with the system, you needed to actually observe it enough to understand uh, how it was working. And so indeed, here is the... So shortly after midnight on, on this particular Friday night, uh, a pair uh, address the algorithms at play. What I think indeed is, is nice is indeed, just as in the kind of spread with Jorn, you have this kind of idea of a, of a kind of understanding. They're both annoyed by the fact that this thing is recording them, but they use it and actually by by really using it correctly they're both uh, in a in a sense uh, get uh, yeah anonymized in some sense uh, and and speak back to this to this algorithm we found yeah that a kind of very strong kind of statement though to be honest and the little coda which I'll just is really the end uh, is at the same time you know this might be a way to talk back to the algorithm but it still misses the sort of third faces, which is something we're very interested in. This is a kind of representation of the faces again, like the snakes behind the face detection. So the algorithm that we use has been trained uh, and is based on a model of faces. So we, we sort of played with the, the faces on the street and the faces in the archive, but in fact there's a, th a sort of third set of bodies that were not uh, accounted for uh, in this in particular installation. And I think that's, a, yeah, a very interesting question that we're facing, actually, how to talk about that. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah well, a little over. No, less. Is it? Yeah, yeah. Ah, okay. I thought we were way over. Good. Abrimos turno para preguntas. Alguien... Tiene alguna pregunta lo que quiera. Yes. 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 
¿no? Pues, bueno, como estaremos por aquí todo el día, en cualquier caso, si surgen cosas después a lo largo del día, en los intermedios que hagamos y todo esto, if, I mean, there are no questions now, but we are going to have the, the rest of the day, so we can yep. also, like, look for you and ask, like, for... <laughs> and if it's okay, we'll just leave the books here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Day, yeah. So, yeah. Han traído, han traído una serie de publicaciones relacionadas con sus proyectos y su trabajo que, que tiene bastante eh, interés que, ve, que veamos, ¿no? Así como en formato papel y para entender un poco más algunas de las cosas que han explicado. Así que las tendremos por aquí todo el día y si tenéis curiosidad también aprovechamos en los intermedios para, para echar una mano. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you. And thank you also Thanks because uh, thank you for having us. Yes. <laughs> awesome. Vamos, vamos a hacer un descanso hasta, hasta las 12. Aprovecho el momento este previo al descanso para comentaros una cosa que no se me olvide, que ayer se me olvidó, y es que en la, en la página web del museo, en la ficha de la, de la actividad, hay por un lado un, un link con un PDF con bibliografía relacionada eh, con, el, con el seminario, por si os interesa ampliar, y luego también hay todo un, un listado de programas de, del proyecto Radio Web Magua, que lleva muchos años eh, reflexionando sobre cuestiones de archivo y hemos hecho una selección de entre los muchos eh, eh, podcasts que tienen, unos cuantos que están eh, muy vinculados con la cuestión de archivo y que también os invitamos a, a visitar si es que no estáis familiarizados con ellos. Eh, volvemos a las 12, otra vez aquí. Gracias.